Warner Amex is dedicated to programming leadership in the communities it serves. But there is another kind of leadership, too. Technological leadership. And technological leadership is squarely centered on the Warner Amex system we call Cube. Naturally, Cube has attracted a lot of attention, particularly from the networks. The story of Nickelodeon begins where every story begins, in a Japanese hotel room. Specifically, a room here, the Hotel New Otani Tokyo. Opening its doors on September 1st, 1964, in time for the Tokyo Olympics, it was set to be the most modern and revolutionary hotel of its age. Utilizing new architectural techniques such as curtain walls and prefabricated unit bathrooms. For a time, it was the tallest building in Tokyo and has hosted numerous world leaders, celebrities, and business people over the years. One such business person was Steve Ross, CEO, President, and Chairman of Warner Communications Incorporated. In 1975, Ross was in Tokyo for some reason or another and was staying in the new Otani. And out of all the things he took away from this trip, it was the hotel's closed circuit televisions that interested him the most. In keeping with the hotel's desire to be the most cutting edge place in Japan, the new Otani had commissioned Pioneer Electronics, which at the time was primarily a stereo manufacturer, to design an interactive closed circuit system that would allow guests to perform certain functions via their television. The exact nature of the system wasn't documented. One imagines it was for simple things like ordering room service through your television remote instead of your telephone, which sounds silly, but would actually be useful for non-Japanese speaking guests who could change the system settings to their native language and punch in an order of steak and wine. However it worked, Steve Ross was impressed and realized that this system could be scaled up. Steve Ross was gonna create interactive cable television. To understand the significance of this idea, we need to briefly talk about the creation of cable television. These days, we think of cable or satellite packages as a source of alternative programming to broadcast television. You get cable so that you can get HBO because ABC isn't going to be playing Game of Thrones. That wasn't originally the case though. Okay, so first we had broadcast television, which sent television signals over the air via radio waves. Television stations transmitted the signal and you picked it up at home via antenna, which worked well enough, but there was a lot of ways for the technology to fail. The antenna isn't set up correctly? Well, no honeymooners for you. The weather is bad at affecting the signal? Guess you'll be missing the Dick Van Dyke show. Even more limiting was geography. If you lived in an area where radio signals didn't get around easily, like say, the mountains, television was, well, inaccessible. Pretty much the moment television became a thing, people were looking for ways to get around those technical limitations. And the solution people settled on was transmitting radio frequency through coaxial cables. You wouldn't need a personal antenna, it wasn't affected by the weather, and it wasn't burdened by inconvenient geography. A definite improvement, but it was still just showing the same channels as broadcast television. It was just another means of getting ABC, CBS, and NBC into your home. This changed with the launch of Home Box Office, or HBO, in 1972 to the Lower Manhattan market by Time Life, and caught fire on September 30th, 1975, when Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier fought for the third and final time in The Thrilla in Manila. The fight was broadcast on HBO, and marked the first time a continuous satellite signal had been delivered by any television network, meaning that cable was no longer tied to the hip to broadcast television. However, as an outgrowth of broadcast television, the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, still regulated it as broadcast television, which made expanding into original non-broadcast channels and programming a challenge. The FCC actually threatened to stop HBO's transmissions if they kept using satellites. The FCC, an appointed body, not elected, answerable only to the president, decided on its own that radio and television were the only two parts of American life not protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution. In order to shake off these regulations, cable television would have to demonstrate capabilities beyond just being more of the same stuff you got over the airwaves. Which brings us back to Steve Ross. At the time he was staying in that hotel room, Warner Cable, a subsidiary of Warner Communications, was the third largest cable provider in the US, with 138 cable operations. But Ross didn't want his cable company to be big, he wanted to expand the definition of cable television into something unique and high-tech. 
And if maybe we could shake the FCC, that wouldn't be so bad either. So development of an interactive cable system got underway. Ross teamed up with Gustav M. Hauser, the man running Warner Cable at the time, and got in touch with Pioneer Electronics, the guys behind the new Otani television system, to help develop the technology. Of course, you can't just unleash revolutionary tech on the whole world all at once. You have to test it, which means you need a test market. And that test market was Columbus, Ohio, one of the fastest growing cities east of the Rockies, north of the Mason-Dixon line. Columbus already had a history of being a test market city. It was the test city for square milk bottles, the family sized Coca-Cola bottle, Reynolds Wrap, Lipton iced tea mix, Swanson's chicken pies, and um, Hustler. And now it was time to test the first interactive cable television program. On December 1st, 1977, Columbus was introduced to Cube. So here's how Cube worked. Each house was wired with a large black box that was kind of a proto remote control for the system. You used it to select a channel and you used it for various interactive functions depending on the show that channel was airing. The response wasn't immediate. It said every six seconds the system would send a signal to a base computer. This signal told the computer three things. One, is the television on? Two, what channel is it on? And three, what was the last response button pushed? If the TV is on, and if the channel has an interactive segment playing at that moment, then the response button is registered and affects the interactive segment accordingly. There were five response buttons, and it was up to the show how those buttons were translated into the interactive functions. It usually meant a lot of live polls with up to five options. Cube boasted 30 channels, which was huge for the time. Most cable packages topped out at 12. These channels were split into three categories, 10 channels each. First was television, which basically meant standard broadcast programming, your ABCs and PBSs and all that. The second was community, where most of the interactive stuff was happening. We'll get back to that one. And then premium, one of the very first versions of pay-per-view. You press the response button corresponding to, yeah, I wanna watch this, which turned the channel on and the cost of viewing added to your monthly bill. Premium channels usually consist of recent blockbuster films and um, adult films. It probably comes as no surprise that the porn was where Cube ended up making most of its money. The community channels weren't as profitable, but they were at the heart of the experiment. Of course you needed content, and creating 10 entire channels worth of content from scratch in a matter of months? That's no easy task. Programming was put into the hands of Michael Dan, who had previously been the Vice President of Programming at CBS and a consultant for the Children's Television Workshop. Between his connections and a group of fresh-faced Columbus locals wanting to break into the industry, a core creative team, affectionately called Mike's Whiz Kids, was created to set about filling these 10 community channels with wholesome and often interactive content. Clearly, these circumstances were better suited for certain types of programming. With a million dollar budget and 250 staffers spread out over 10 channels and a mandate of making these programs interactive, the Cube community channels are best suited for live poll shows like consumer reports that ask viewers about the effectiveness of special advertisements or game shows where the audience play the role as judge. Like this local talent show program that functioned like the gong show. You punch into the Cube remote if you like the act or not, and if the performer drops to a low enough score, their performance is ended and they leave. You in the back roads, but the river's on my memory. Keeps you ever gentle on my mind. It's not clinging to the rocks and the ivy planted on the columns now that bind me. Some oh, Betty Shepherd. Okay, thank you. They're tough out there tonight. I'll tell you. Narrative programming uh, didn't work quite as well. Some shows offered little choose-your-own-adventure style branching paths, and due to the clumsiness of the system, they were all pretty much comedies, which was for the best, really. 
Lulu had different segments recorded beforehand and then those segments were switched out with voting, while Bubba Johnson was performed live, limited to a small studio space and was prone to technical issues like bad sound mixes. None of these shows were great, they were just filling space. If you wanted some good stories, you best stick to broadcast. But the community channels still had their charm, and a quarter of Cube users actively participated in their interactive functions. And then there were the public affairs programs. The interactive nature of Cube allowed Columbus citizens to interact with local, state, and federal political leaders without leaving their homes. One significant example came on July 15, 1979, when President Jimmy Carter gave his famous Malaysia speech. Cube followed the speech with an interactive poll show asking for local opinions on Carter and his policy, which a lot of professional pollsters took umbrage with, marking the first time doubt was placed on network-run polling. Now, Cube was the centerpiece of this operation, but Warner Communications took the technology beyond just television. This system of sending signals through coaxial cable to a central location was also basis for the first home security systems, home protection that connected straight to law enforcement. There were proposed ideas for exclusive channels to doctors and other medical professionals to announce and discuss new medications, home shopping and home auction programs were developed, there were also some experiments in computer data links, but that didn't really take off. The point being, Warner Cable was about more than just television. It was pay-per-view, it was community, it was polls, it was games, it was home security, it was a tool for professional environments, it was shopping, it was baby's first internet. And that was the ammo Warner needed to combat the FCC regulations. And they won! Hauser approached a bunch of senators, and after a lot of deliberation, it was decided that cable wasn't just a model of broadcast television. It was something unique to itself, and many of the regulations were removed in the heyday of Cube. Of course, heydays come to an end. Business can change really fast, and by 1982, five years into Cube's run, Warner Communications was becoming a very different beast. How that all played out, I'm going to save for future episodes, but let's just say that Warner put a bit too much money into the video game bubble, and by the end of the year Hauser was gone, half the company was owned by American Express, and Warner's cable platform had to be trimmed. While Cube had been a local hit, it wasn't a substantial business model, with a debt of $175 million by 1983. The live interactive programming came to an end, which came as a relief to its competitors, who didn't really have a way to compete against that kind of product. At this point, Cube just became a name for what we would now consider a standard cable package, and even the name was gone by 1985, with things just running under the name of Warner Cable and later Time Warner Cable. Cube was no more. But I don't really think of it as a failure. At the 1981 National Cable's Television Association convention, Trigiv Marin, president of the American TV and Communications Division of Time Life, argued against rushing into the interactive television market, stressing caution and careful pretesting, saying, first is not necessarily being best in the new product area. To which Hauser, who was also attending the event, replied, someone has to be first so others can be prudent. Cube had to be first so that the ideas and technologies it created could be further developed and implemented down the line. Cube changed the relationship between product and consumer in ways that are still reflected today. The only difference between this... There they are, and when you see the flashing sign, you will pick this way. Touch button number one for Candy and Nate. When you see the flashing sign... Two sweethearts, right? On their way. Button number two for Rico McCoy, our disco dancer and model at Lazarus. When you see the flashing sign, touch button number three for Billy Darefield. And this. Don't vote until we end this thing in just a second. Siobhan, ladies and gentlemen, the recap one more time, then you can vote. Take a look at this. is that the latter is the synthesis of several technologies instead of the application of one dedicated technology. Cube laid down the groundwork for pay-per-view, home shopping networks, news station polling, home security networks, spun off a very few influential cable channels, and of course got the FCC to drop the regulations. The ripples of Cube are still felt today, and perhaps that's a standard success we all should aim for. Not in creating something that lasts, but in creating something that is influential, that is felt, that is a stepping stone for others to be elevated. 
I, mean, I don't want to get too sentimental. Cube was a corporate product that elevated other corporate products. But lasting forever is impossible. Everything is finite. We all return to dust at the end. But we do leave ripples. And just because something doesn't last long, doesn't mean its ripples can't be massive. Of course, there's one thing about Cube I didn't bring up. We discussed the community channels and sampled some of their programmings, but one of these channels, a channel called C3, was developing a program that would change the face of children's television forever. Nick, 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 Next time on Nick Knacks, Cube puts on a puppet show which takes a life and a channel of its own. A major source in researching this video was Wired Cities, Shaping the Future of Communications, which has a pretty hefty chapter on Cube written while the program was still active. If you're interested, I've left a link to its Amazon page in the description, or you could check out your local library. If you're interested in helping Nick Knacks and other Paparina projects, perhaps consider contributing to my Patreon. Patreon is what gives me the time to work on projects like this instead of working the 9 to 5. Uh, no offense to Dolly Parton. <laughs>